if I can get some of you to come to even some of these front rows, it's so nice to, I'll tell you, when I'm leading, it feels so much better when you see people sitting there. So if a few of you would be willing. Thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. So I have the pleasure of um, introducing Rabbi Rick Jacobs. I got to say a few words already in services this morning if you were in this, in this worship space this morning. But how do I begin? I met Rick Jacobs when I was 19 years old. I song led um, for a confirmation retreat at Westchester Reform Temple. It's one of the things I did in college to earn a little extra money is I would do like retreats for the weekend and play my guitar. Anyway, I met Rabbi Rick Jacobs when he was only in his second year, I think, as the senior rabbi of Westchester Reform Temple. And it really changed the course of my entire rabbinic and cantorial career. I wouldn't have even had a cantorial career without Rick. So I was fortunate that um, over the next 12 years, either beginning as a song leader with them when I was just a college student to becoming their intern while I was in cantorial school and rabbinical school to becoming um, an assistant rabbi slash cantor when I was there. I spent 12 years watching Rick go from his second year as the rabbi to um, fully into his career. I got to watch transformation of an already wonderful stellar community to really being a national model for the entire reform movement. I got to study at the feet of a master. And in addition to that, Rick and his wife Susie and their family adopted me because I was 21 and living in Scarsdale, which is a weird thing if you know Scarsdale, single by myself. And so I was just on the meal plan at their house. Um, they, they took me in. I tucked their boys into bed at night. It was really, um, it was a gift. And they are not just um, rabbi and teachers, but family to me. And I'm so blessed. Uh, Rick is now, he, I mean, he was, um, not just, he was just an innovator in his congregation as a senior rabbi at Westchester Reform Temple, and um, it became, as I said, a model for congregations everywhere. And he was beloved, and for most rabbis, you're in a situation like that, and you just stay in it because it's good, and, um, and you're able to do good work. But the reform movement came calling and said, we need your leadership. And that's not an easy thing to do, but Rick stepped up to be the president of the reform movement, a movement which comprises 900 congregations, including our own, over 1.5 million Jews, and I would say growing under his leadership. Under his leadership, we have become an even more inclusive reform movement, reaching out to Jews of color in a different way than we ever had before, reaching out to gay and lesbian and transgender Jews, and Rick has also moved the needle tremendously forward in terms of pluralism in Israel. He has been one of the key players, maybe the key player, for making sure there will be an egalitarian prayer space at the wall and really developing a relationship with the important leaders in Israel to recognize Reform Judaism. So he is truly all of our leader, all of our rabbi. Whether you know it or not, he is leading the way for Jews all around the world. So what a blessing that we have him here. What a blessing for me that I get to have my teacher here and mentor, and for us to be able to learn from him this afternoon. So I welcome Rabbi Rick Jacobs. Thank you, Rabbi Bookdahl. You should just know when Angela called me, she said, Rick, I have a favor, and I said, yes. He said, usually when people call to ask you a favor, you wait to hear what the favor is. I said, no, the answer is yes. What do you want? What, what can I do? How can I be helpful? And she gave this wonderful invitation to be here with all of you today. And what a spectacular, inspiring Yom Kippur of uh, lifting our souls and reminding us what really matters and how a community of faith can not just reshape a congregation, it can reshape who we are 
and it can emanate out and help reshape an entire world. So in this particular part of the afternoon, you're thinking we could have gone home and taken a nap, but we stuck around. So let me tell you why I hope that you'll not only stick around, but lean in. We Jewish people, we like to say that we're one. It's a slogan, we hear it all the time. But I have to say, oftentimes it feels rather contrived to say, the Jewish people, we are one. We actually are so different, so diverse, that we really struggle to figure out what is, if there is any glue, some commonality that holds us together. We oftentimes confuse unity with unanimity. It's hard to actually imagine a more divisive time, not just for the Jewish people, but can I just speak for all of you and say for our country? Um, so though I'm going to focus with your participation on how we not only understand the diversity and the complexity of our own people, and how we try to shape some unity there, I hope the, the application at the end of our study will be that maybe it gives us a hint as to how a country that's feeling even more divided than ever might also grab hold of something that undergirds us deeper. We have sacred text, we have each of our experiences, and we have a lot of issues in front of us, and we have this next hour. Let's dive in. I start with a story. I'm gonna move around. I hope that if this, in terms of the camera, it doesn't work. If I get too far over, someone will just pull me back with a gesture. So I, I was privileged to have a chevruta. Does anybody know what a chevruta is? Yeah, a study partner, excellent. My chevruta was Rabbi Jacob Rubinstein. I have a beloved Rabbi Rubinstein, as you do our Rabbi Emeritus. Rabbi Rubenstein, Rabbi Jacob Rubenstein, was for many, many years the rabbi of young Israel of Scarsdale, an incredibly brilliant and inspiring Orthodox rabbi. He was born in a DP camp after World War II, and the two of us became literally study partners. We studied regularly together. And one era of Rosh Hashanah, Rabbi Rubenstein called me up. It was, it was in the morning early. It was the day of the beginning of the new year. And he said, Rick, I did it. I said, Mossel Tough, that's great. What did you do? Did you finish your sermon for the first day? What did you do? He said, no, 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 bigger, bigger, bigger. I said, well, tell me. I finally did it. I finally convinced the Orthodox rabbis of Westchester to redraw the boundary of, that we call the Aruv. Put your hand up if you've ever heard of an Aruv. The, great. The Aruv in the Jewish tradition is a, a symbolic boundary that goes around a community and it allows people to carry within the Aruv. It basically just describes that as the community. And it's, it's a big deal. And if you look out on any Shabbat here in Manhattan, if the A-roof somehow isn't working, you won't see traditional Jews carry. So I was unbelievably moved. He said, you know, it wasn't easy. And I know that he spent three years trying to convince the Orthodox rabbis to do what he did, which was to include Westchester Reform Temple in the A-roof. And the Orthodox rabbi said, why would you want to do that? Those people over there, you know, they don't really know, they don't really do, they don't really have the same commitments we have. He convinced them by saying, if we draw the Aruv wider, it will encourage us to have deeper, more natural, and more loving relationships among the diverse Jewish people in our community. Gulp. I couldn't wait to get to services on Erev Rosh Hashanah. I couldn't wait to tell people and I remember I went up to one of the founding members of this wonderful congregation, then more classical reform, and I said, do you know that we're now in the A roof? And this person looked at me and said, what's that? 
And after I described it, she told me, who cares? That's such an antiquated bunch of nonsense from antiquity. I said, you don't understand. Rabbi Rubenstein drew a circle around his Jewish community, and he included you and me in it. I said, what have either of us done that redraws the map of our Jewish community and creates a different sense of responsibility and connectedness to those who are not just like us? So today in our text that we're going to look at, I'm going to ask if we could think about widening the Eruv of our Jewish world and see if we can't include some folks who otherwise, they're not going to be inside that Eruv. They're going to be like those who were thinking about a smaller circle and let everyone else be on the outside. I think it's an urgent task for us as a Jewish community. So take the te study text. I hope you have one. If you don't, maybe someone next to you does. And I've assembled a few texts that I think will help us and will provoke us and challenge us and maybe even inspire us. The first text I want you to look at on the bottom of the first page, because we, we, we heard it so beautifully chanted this morning. It is the, the passage that we in the Reform Movement read on Yom Kippur morning. It's called Nitzavim from the end of Deuteronomy. So on the bottom of the page, you see that it says, Atem netzavim hayom kulchem lifnei Adonai Eloheichem rasheichem. It says, you stand this day kulchem, all of you. The text is trying to make sure that we don't leave anyone outside the circle. So it says kulchem, every single one. And then it assumes that we're going to leave people out. This is biblically, but it'll help us today. It assumes we're going to leave people out, so then it spells out who's included. So it says, all of you, who? The machers, the tribal heads, the elders, it's another way to say leader, the officials, the, the institutional leaders, but then it continues. All the men of Israel, we probably think in many ways it would end there, but it doesn't. Look, your children, women, the stranger, the one who's just an outsider, he or she is also counted within this moment. And then it says, the wood chopper and the water drawer. Now, why do you have to say the wood chopper and the water drawer? What, what is that calling attention to? If you're trying to say everyone, why don't you just say everyone? Do you have to actually spell it out? Why do we actually have to mention in specificity people like the wood chopper and the water drawer? Any, any thoughts? Call it out. Yeah. The lowest class and the poorest, who easily in any moment in Jewish history could be left outside the circle. So the Torah doesn't even give us the, the, the moment to draw it more narrowly, especially those who are on the bottom of the heap. They are a part of you. So let's have a little exercise just to get us warmed up if we could. I don't think the Torah could have known who the people we would leave out of our circle, our Eruv, our drawing of the boundaries of our relationship, of our responsibility. But I want us to see if we can't make Kul Chem, all of you, feel more real at this moment. So we're, what, give me specifics that will really stretch us in terms, I mean, you could say east siders and west siders, you know, not such a big stretch, although we want to be nice back and forth across the park, right? Give me some ideas of how could we really open this thing up and make the all of us real. The homeless. You heard that beautiful Devar Haftarah before we read from Isaiah 58. The people we walk by. Yes. Those who are not celebrating because they're out doing this work that actually sustains our whole world. Beautiful, beautiful. Love that. Give me some more because I, yes. Say it again. The mentally ill, the mentally Ill right? Because again, you know, our Jewish community will want to get everybody who kind of fits on the postcard, but let's make the, let's not make it a postcard. Let's make it a, 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 a portrait of all of us. Yes. 
prisoners. Beautiful, beautiful. So we're getting the perfect litany of the contemporary water drawers and wood choppers. Can I just stretch this a little bit more too? Does anybody want to put an ultra-Orthodox Jew, a Hasidic Jew, in this list here? Are they part of our responsibility? Really? We have to? <laughs> of course. How about, how about Jews who are completely secular, who walk by Lincoln Center today and want to know what were all those people walking into Lincoln Center with velvet little bags with them? What, are they part of our responsibility too? They, they don't join, they don't participate, they're not contributing, so are we including them in our circle? Big time, because you know what? There are more of them than us. So. Yeah, that's perfect, perfect. I heard a sermon by Rabbi Angela Bookdahl today. Can I forgive someone who didn't ask for forgiveness, didn't earn forgiveness? Can I actually include somebody in my circle who doesn't include me in theirs? Exactly where we're going. So hold that thought, because we're going to get there. So I think you get a sense of some of the ways we stretch, but I think we got, I want two more big, big stretches. Yeah. Beautiful. The LGBTQ community who for too long has felt as if the Jewish community drew the boundaries and they were outside. There's even a beautiful synagogue here in Manhattan, Beit Simcha Torah, the gay and lesbian synagogue, which is fabulous. But you know what? You should be able to choose any synagogue you want. There shouldn't be a, only, only one place where you're welcome. Who else? Stretch us all the way. Say. Those whose presence make us uncomfortable. That's a big circle. Right? So, so again, let's, let's see if we can, we're going to go through this, we're going to stretch it as we go, but I want to just start, uh, move you up to the top of the page. Rabbi Abraham Isaac Cook was the first chief Ashkenazic rabbi of Mandate Palestine. And he was a chief rabbi, he looked like a chief rabbi, he was six foot seven. Can you imagine somebody in the early part of the 20th century? No, he was six seven, he was a giant. He had a big strimal beard and he walked around and he included especially the secular uh, halutzim, the pioneers who came to settle the land of Israel, and he never judged them. He never scolded them. He just included them. This was a chief rabbi who looked at the diversity and loved the diversity and could serve as a galvanizing figure. It has not been always that way since. So just, I'm going to just walk you in a few key dramatic leaps here. We're in Lincoln Center, so we can do a little ballet. We can kind of take a, a jeté here. So right below, um, I, I just want to just give you the opening frame of Isaac, um, Rav, we call him Rav Cook. This is his commentary on the prayer book, his comment particularly about the prayer of peace. He says, there are those who mistakenly think that, the wor that world peace can only come when there is a unity of opinions and character traits. Therefore, when scholars and students of Torah disagree and develop multiple approaches and methods, they think that they are causing strife and opposing shalom. So he doesn't just act in a kind of a friendly way. He puts it into his commentary, into his sacred uh, text, that actually that complexity, those dissonances, they actually can lead to strength if we know what to do with that. So I want to just, if I can, I want to take us a little bit into a contemporary challenge. And I think your question about those who don't include us, uh, can we in fact include them? So um, how many people here have ever been to the Western Wall in Jerusalem? OK, I'm thinking that overwhelming majority. Uh, how many people remember where it separates men and women and there's beautiful traditional prayer going on, but it's not always a place that we could go and do what we did today with such a fervor and such devotion. If we were to do even a modicum of what we did today there, it wouldn't be pretty because the, the Western Wall is currently under the rule of a rabbi, an ultra-Orthodox rabbi, who governs that place. 
um, another story. Just a few days ago, I was in Jerusalem for the funeral of Shimon Peres, extraordinary leader. If you want to understand an Eruv that was broad, his life and even his funeral drew an unbelievable circle, not just around the Jewish community, but around the world community, the people who were there. So you might not know that Shimon Peres' daughter, uh, Tziki, is one of the leaders of our reform movement in Israel. And when her husband, Rafi, who's also a remarkable leader of our movement as well, and leads the largest um, hospital in Israel, Tel Shomer in Tel Aviv, when they heard that I was coming for the funeral, Rafi called me and said, I don't want the state of Israel to disrespect my, my movement. So um, he said, I'm going to call I'm going to call the Minister of Culture and Sport, who was in charge of the logistics. And Rick, I'm going to ask if you would be seated with the family. It's very touched to be included. I get there the morning of the funeral, and I'm seated with the chief rabbis. And they're probably thinking to themselves, who's he? <laughs> who's that guy? But even more so, two seats over is the rabbi of the Western Wall, the guy who has jurisdiction over what goes on and what doesn't go on there. So it's a couple of days before Rosh Hashanah. We're here to remember Shimon Peres, who had everybody in his circle. So I just said, you know what? I put my hand out. I said, uh, Rav Rabinovich, Shana Tova. And he took my hand and looked in my eyes and said, Shana Tova. And I realized he had no idea who, he, who I was, because he has refused to meet with any of the non-Orthodox leaders in Israel or from abroad that have been working with the Prime Minister on creating a compromise at the Western Wall. So a nice gentleman who happens now to be the Attorney General, Avichai Mendelblit, who was leading the effort from the Prime Minister's office, introduced me to Rafa Kotel, the rabbi of the Wall, and he looked for a moment panicked. He was still holding my hand during the introduction, and I could see him trying to figure out, how do I get my hand out of this guy's hand? <laughs> and even more so, um, you know, looking up, is there going to be a lightning strike at this moment? And if it is, is it going to kill him or me or both? And um, I just wanted to leave it in a good place. We are embroiled in a very, very intense struggle, which isn't it isn't personal, it's about the state of Israel drawing a giant new boundary for our people about who matters. So I have in this little packet on the second page a little excerpt from the, the most recent petition our movement has submitted to the Supreme Court of Israel. And it is a petition that is actually a combination of three or four different separate petitions, because earlier in September, when one of those petitions was before the Supreme Court, the chief of the Supreme Court in Israel said to the Israeli government, enough is enough. What was she referring to? She was referring to, on January 31st, the government of Israel, in a 15 to 5 decision, ruled that there would be a new space at the Western Wall for egalitarian pluralistic prayer, just as we do here at Central and throughout our movement. And even more so, it created all of us non-Orthodox leaders as those who had, would set the policy for this site, and that we would have a government of Israel budget to administer the site. It would be the first time ever in the history of the State of Israel that that would be the case. Well, the vote was 15 to 5, and we were running ahead, ready to implement this. Two weeks later, the Supreme Court made another ruling about mikvahs, ritual baths, that said that we, all of us, have access to all of the mikvahs. There was another series of decisions. The ultra-Orthodox political parties panicked, and they said this will end our religious oversight, I would call it monopoly, in the state of Israel. So they pushed back hard. Fast forward to the beginning of September when they before the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, enough is enough. It is time to implement 
this government decision? Well, we've been fighting for 27 years. We've been intensely working for the last four years with the Prime Minister, who has been an amazing partner, as well as members of the Israeli government who have also been willing to work with us. But the ultra-Orthodox are now putting a lot of pressure on, which is why if you were at services early this morning, I asked you if you would, after the holiday, raise your voice. The Prime Minister, the President, President Ruvi Rivlin, the Speaker of the Knesset, Yuli Edelstein, and Naftali Bennett, who's the Minister of Diaspora Affairs and Education, they don't think that the non-Orthodox community around the world really has as strong a connection as we do to Israel and as strong a commitment to making Israel inclusive and home for all of us, whether we're ultra-Orthodox or secular, whether we're Russian or we're Israeli, whether we are rich or whether we are poor, whether we are believers or whether we are atheists. That place belongs to all of us, and it's meant to be a symbolic change that could symbolize all the change throughout. So all you have to do, please remember, I know it's the day you should be remembering who you want to seek forgiveness from and who you want to offer forgiveness to, but if you can tuck three letters in that memory bank, URJ, the Union for Reform Judaism, at the top of the home page, it says demand equality. Click there, send an email to Prime Minister, to the President, Speaker of the Knesset, and the Minister of Diaspora Affairs. Tell them how much you love and care about the state of Israel and the kind of society that we create. Uh, it's an incredible opportunity, and this actually will make a difference because the Prime Minister says, I hear from the ultra-Orthodox every minute of the day how much they don't want us to have full equality. That's expressed. We're, by the way, doing this with JFNA, the federations. New York is one of the most important of the federations we have in Jewish life. We're doing it with the conservative movement, the American Jewish Committee, the ADL, are all aligned to take a strong and clear and public stand. So if you'll look at the second page, I want you to just see what a Supreme Court petition in Israel looks like. Uh, it's a legal document to be sure, but look at this. Sitting at the top of the conclusion is a quote from the Babylonian Talmud. Can you imagine the U.S. Supreme Court, you have a little, you know, you come up before Ruth Bader Ginsburg and you start with a little Talmud quote first just to get you everybody started. But this Talmudic quote isn't just an ordinary quote. It has within it the very substance of how we could redraw the map of our Jewish lives. So let me just, if I could, share it with you. And this was in the October 6th petition that we resubmitted. It says, for three years, the house of Hillel and the house of Shammai argued. One said, the halakha is like us, the way we interpret it. The other said, no, no, the halakha is the way we interpret it. And a heavenly coal, a bat coal, came and said, elu ve'elu, these Hillel and these Shammai are both, they're both the words of the living God. Why was halakha established, however, to follow the opinion of Hillel? Because in most cases, when the Talmud rules, it favors the decisions of Hillel. Why? If they're both words of the living God, here's the, here's the answer. Because the students of Hillel were kind and humble, and they always taught their ideas by not only respecting the ideas of their opponent, Shammai, but beginning their arguments by arguing for the plausibility of their opponent before they would actually offer their own views. Can you imagine what, what our world would be like if Hillel and Shammai could have the say in how we did our work? Can you imagine what Jewish life would be that the chief rabbi and the head of the reform movement, you know, elu ve'elu divrei Elohim chayim. These and these are the words of the living God. What would it mean for the U.S. Congress? I know that's not a Judaic body. What would it mean for the Knesset of Israel? What would it mean for all of our communal institutions if we had such regard for the opinions and ideas of those who we oppose? 
those who we disagree with. We, we, we so valued what they had to say that we actually begin by arguing they have a point. Does this sound like pie in the sky to people? Does this sound like it's describing an alt, sort of an alternate universe? It does to me. But in this argument for the Supreme Court of Israel, this text was to say, there's not a chance in the world that our community should be preferencing one part of the Jewish community over the others. Can I just tell you about our four years of compromise with the government of Israel over this site? At first, we wanted to actually, remember at the site, there's men, women. We wanted there to be men, women, and together, three sections. Uh, but what we were taught immediately by the ultra-Orthodox is that would be untenable to them. So we said, you know what? We're willing to have men, women, which would allow the ultra-Orthodox to do their holy work, and they should be able to do their holy work with our respect, and we're going to have a site just a little bit further down in the southern part of the Kotel. The Kotel goes for a very long way, and that way we will be compromising and therefore everyone will have his or her place. Seemed like a brilliant and a very Jewish solution. It's the solution of Hillel and Shammai. It's not yet a solution that the ultra-Orthodox can stomach. And it's really a challenge. I was on a live call in radio show with one of the ultra-Orthodox party leaders. And they, they had me on one line and I did my interview, and they said, Rabbi, would you stay on the line? I said, I'd be happy to. And they got the leader of one of the largest ultra-Orthodox parties, and they said, Rabbi Eichler, uh, we have Rabbi Jacobs on the line. Would you like to say something to him about, about this compromise, about this effort at the Western Wall to share the holiest space? And, um, and then all of a sudden, I got a whisper in my ear. They said, Rabbi Jacobs, He's on the line. If you want to say something to him, I would say it now. And I would say it quickly. So I said, Rabbi Eichler, I'd love to have the opportunity to sit with you and to share together what we could do to strengthen the Jewish people. What could we do to strengthen the bonds of Jews all over the world to the state of Israel? Would you be willing to sit and have that conversation? Well, at that moment, you know, it's hard to hear with cell phones, but the equivalent of a click. <laughs> Rabbi Eichler had hung up because he was not interested in that conversation. It's your, it's your question from before. Are we really going to make, within our circle, within our Aruv, room for people who, who denigrate us, who not only disagree with us, but they absolutely oppose everything that we are? Well, the answer is, I think that's part of what being a Jewish community is. I don't want to be in a Jewish community just with people who are just like me. How boring would that be? But I actually don't even always agree with myself. So I'm pretty interesting just being myself. How about you? Do you ever find yourself in an internal conflict about what you really think or what you really believe? So the idea of how do we actually shape a community where we have people who really disagree, um, when I asked you before about stretching the boundaries, no one used the names of political parties. Uh, I think that would be a good thing to figure out how do we really become a Jewish community that we have progressives and more conservative voices, that we have all the different polarities, all the different approaches to ritual, all the different approaches to what it means to live a life of holiness, a life of purpose. So for us, this, I think, is not just an issue at the Western Wall. It's an issue here in New York. It's an issue in Las Cruces, New Mexico. And let me just make this very real. Um, we're the movement that includes interfaith families in a very profound way. Uh, we believe deeply that we are strengthened by those who come from interfaith families. Can I just make this abundantly clear by giving you an example that would be the equivalent of a slam dunk? Rabbi Angela Warnick Bookdahl. 
Rabbi Angela Warnick Bookdahl, I can tell you that I have the privilege over the years that Angela and I worked together, every single bar mitzvah, every single baby name, every single funeral, people would come up to me, never up to Rabbi Angela, and they would always ask me the same question. Where's she from? <laughs> and I would always give the same answer, Tacoma, Washington. And they'd say, no, 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 that's not what I, that's not what I mean. Well, where's she from? And I said, to call me, no, no, no. I said, well, she's, she's, she was born in Seoul, Korea, um, raised within the Jewish community, and she's a full rabbi and a full cantor. And they always ask the following, yes, but is she Jewish? <laughs> what, what part of she's a fully trained rabbi and a fully trained cantor did not come across? Can you imagine Jewish life without Rabbi Angela Warnick Bookdahl? I can't. I simply can't imagine it. And I can't imagine Central Synagogue without the interfaith families. I can't imagine the Reform Movement. Why are we the largest movement in Jewish life, which we are, larger than the Orthodox, Conservative, and Reconstructionist movements combined? Why are we larger? Because the Aru that we draw includes those who are not only excluded by others, but denigrated by others. So we're fighting for the very soul of our Jewish community in doing this. And it's not that everyone agrees with every part of our inclusion, which by the way, at our recent biennial last November, we passed the most advanced resolution by a religious group on transgender inclusion. The New York Times called up and they said, transgender inclusion? Is it really that important? And we said, yeah. So do you know the suicide rate among transgender teens, do you know? Well, it's pretty much the highest there is. Uh, we have transgender campers in our 16 overnight camps. We have inclusion in terms of not just LGBTQ and interfaith families, but also people who, who never, they're Jewish by birth, but they never discovered it. We have the ability to bring them all close by conveying a Judaism that is open, alive, and growing stronger in our diversity. So I wanna, I wanna just take you couple more places, if I could, before we conclude. Look at the last page. This is a text from the Mishnah. It's uh, the earliest code of Jewish law after the Bible, roughly codified in the year 200 of the Common Era. It's the first stratum of the Babylonian Talmud. And in this Mishnah, which is a little bit confusing, so I'm not gonna go into all of its details because that will require not just a Yom Kippur study, it will require a series of studies, but I wanna give you the key teaching that comes from this, uh, this teaching. So there is in Judaism something called the Leverite marriage. Has anybody ever heard of the Leverite marriage? Thankfully, it's not something we do today. The Leverite marriage was to say that if, um, if your brother died before he was able to raise a family, you have an obligation to marry uh, your sister-in-law, your brother's wife. Not the simplest human dynamic probably to negotiate, but it was a way of keeping a family's uh, name alive, keeping a uh, hereditary portion of the land in the family, and you could actually get out of the Levite marriage with a ritual called chalitza, which was a public act of saying, I don't want to marry this, this widow who happens to be my sister-in-law. And it was a humiliating and a very, very um, kind of uh, uh, public moment of separation. So here, let me just walk you through this because the point is so profound and so counterintuitive, and so much where we as a community need to be. So Beit Shammai permit the rivals to the brothers, meaning the many different um, 
spouse, spouses of the, of the brothers. But Hillel prohibits, if they perform the ritual of chalitza, the, the, the sort of public rejection of the Levite marriage, Beit Shammai disqualify them from marrying priests. But Hillel allows it. I know you're thinking, what does this have to do with anything, Rabbi Jacobs? Stay with me another moment. If they had submitted to Yibum, Beit Shammai allows, but Hillel, dis Beit Hillel disqualifies. Now listen to this. Even though these prohibit and these permit, these declare ineligible and these declare eligible, Beit Shammai did not refrain from marrying women of Beit Hillel, nor Beit Hillel from Beit Shammai. So too in all matters of cleanness and uncleanness, which these declared clean and these declared unclean, they did not refrain from relying on one another when preparing clean food. The point I would actually submit to you that the difference between Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai on this one matter of Jewish law is probably as great as the ultra-Orthodox rabbi and our inclusion of interfaith families. It is so, so clearly affecting the genealogy and the legitimacy of the entire subsequent generations of the Jewish people. But what did that cause Hillel and Shammai to do? Not to cut off from one another. They still were happy to have their children intermarry. So it's a bar of what it means to create that kind of Jewish community, that kind of inclusion, that kind of strength, that kind of diversity, that kind of unity without unanimity. So the closing exercise is all you. What could we do today? What could I, each of us as individuals, do that will help redraw the map, the boundary of contemporary Jewish life? And what can we as a community do to redraw that, to expand it, to make it bigger? So I'd like actually not to be rhetorical about that. I'd like to make that a, a, a challenge. Can we have five good, specific ideas of what we can walk out of here after the final shofar is sounded and we make Havdalah and we get back into the routine of our lives? What could we do? And first of all, do we think it's even urgent that we do it? So I'll not give you that as an assumption. But what could each of us do and what could all of us do together that would make us a more inclusive, a more diverse, and a stronger and more dynamic and more powerful Jewish community. Some specifics. Yes? Don't be so judgmental and exclusive with our uh, other denomination sisters and brothers. Beautiful. I'll repeat it so everybody here. Not be so judgmental with all of our denominational partners, right? It starts with me. Like, ugh, those people, you know what they do, right? You know, can you believe that's what you know, their holiday is? So it actually starts by an internal shift to say, you know what, on Yom Kippur I catch myself, but you know what, what about tomorrow? If we actually were able to somehow act differently, think differently, and judge less, it would begin to change us, which might begin to change all of us. I know you had your hand up before, right there in the back, yeah. Beautiful, so it gave a, a, a very, non-controversial um, example from the presidential election. But the point is, and I think it was a little bit at the end of the second debate, was probably a little bit of that feeling, which is to try and actually do a little Beit Hillel about Shammai. I, I wonder what you know, the thinking and the, um, the reasoning is that leads someone to have a point of view with the presidential election different than me, or maybe a Jewish stance different for me. Maybe I start from the place of trying to understand it before I clobber. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. So the, the idea is if I start from a place of curiosity, what could I learn? As opposed to from the place of fear, like I'm really, you know, opposed. 
And by the way, to me, that was in that moment of shaking the, the rabbi of the wall's hand. I mean, we, we've been carrying on a, a, quite a public fight over these last four years. He's a person, uh, you know, uh, he, he doesn't see Jewish life the way I do, but he's a person and a very significant person. What if I start from those places? What, what does that do? Yeah. Beautiful. We can invite into our, our central synagogue community people who have been disenfranchised. And by the way, you do that so beautifully. If you come on a Friday night, um, it's just striking how many people come who basically never found their way into a Jewish community. Maybe they're not Jewish, maybe they're Jewish, but they just never found a place that really felt like there was a welcome and a, and a there there that was so nourishing, was worth coming in. We can do that, and you are doing that. We want to do that as a movement. We want to do that as a people. We want to do that as individuals. Yeah, just the last couple of thoughts. Yeah. Beautiful. Publicize to interfaith families to get married in the synagogue. To, to say, your place is right here. Right, right here. When we went before but Open Ark, that's your place. To say, you know, it's one thing to say, you know, um, you know, something on our, our website, but to really say it, your place is here. And I think, by the way, if you do the demographics of Jewish life, which everybody does that, it makes us depressed because we think Jewish life is literally coming down to its final few minutes, even though I'm actually at my final moment. Um, I think we could actually send strength. So to conclude, it's up to us. And it starts with little gestures. Little, little gestures. It might start from not only a handshake and a greeting. It might start from stopping a judgment and posing a question. It might be about literally opening our own hearts so that we start to see and act in our community differently. The last line is a line from the Tosefta, also the same time as the the Mishnah, it's from my teacher, Rabbi David Hartman. He wrote an amazing book called A Heart of Many Rooms. I'll leave this as our benediction for our study. I hope we'll not only leave having a sense of we have something to do, like go to urj.org and send the government of Israel a little bit of a nudge from us. Please do that. But we also get up from our prayer today ready to be different, ready to be different individuals, different families, a different congregation, even though we're about as good as we get because we're here together and you know, all the blessings of God's world fall upon our shoulders, but we could be more. And if we could be more, we could touch more lives. We could make more justice, more compassion, uh, more holiness in our world. So with these words, we'll conclude, make yourself a heart of many rooms and bring into it words of the house of Shammai and words of the house of Hillel, those who declare unclean and the words of those who declare clean. May each of us during this new year 5777 cultivate a heart of many rooms and put kulchem, put everyone inside those rooms, those with whom we agree, those with whom we disagree, those with whom we struggle, those with whom we share a commonality of holiness. Let's find the deeper place of unity and not mistakenly reach for unanimity. Shana Tovah.